This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Contact Fairy Godmother Travel today so they can help you book the most marvelous Disney vacation. Email them at communicorweekly at fairygodmothertravel.com and tell them we sent you. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And today we're going to take a trip to a foreign country. Gosh, there's so many of them. I know. It's a surprise which one it's going to be. Well, be like actually random. it's not because, you know, it's in the episode title, so not. Ooh, unless you tricked everybody. Ooh, maybe I did, Ooh. but chances are I didn't. I, I'm pretty sure I put the right, <laughs> the right episode title in there. <laughs> we'll just assume you did. Yeah, we'll, we'll assume, assume that I did, and we should just assume that we're going to go into the history segment now. So we're, we're talking about New Jersey? Exactly. All right. It's time for Disney History. Exploring Epcot's stunning China Pavilion is like taking a journey through Chinese history, where the past and the present combine to create a truly unique experience. There are these lush, tranquil gardens, distinctly vibrant buildings, engaging performers, and delectable eateries surrounding the guests with all the sights, sounds, and aromas of China, from the ancient dynasties to the modern day. Though China was among the original pavilions of the World Showcase when Epcot opened in 1982, it was notably different from the pavilion as it's known today. The shops, restaurants, and now popular attractions did not exist, so guests at the time were drawn to the pavilion to experience authentic Chinese buildings painstakingly uh, replicated from actual locations in China, as well as the landscaped areas invoking the country's hauntingly beautiful geography. China's natural beauty has inspired artists for thousands of years. You know, nature scenes and landscapes have always been prominent in Chinese art, with human figures equal in emphasis to the natural elements surrounding them. The relationship between humans and nature is of particular importance uh, of the artists and the viewer when it comes to Chinese culture. Scenes of interesting rock and stone can also be seen as you approach the China Pavilion. As you do, you'll notice large rock structures near the entrance, as well as stone benches along the lagoon. When planning the pavilion, Imagineers hope that these features, along with the trickling waterfall and serene lotus pool, would provide a sense of peace in the midst of the bustling world showcase. So, contributing to the quiet calm of this area is a lovely garden comprised of plants and flowers that are indigenous to China, including uh, camilla bushes, tallow trees, mulberry trees, and of course, bamboo. Now, bamboo has been heralded as a versatile uh, resource in China for thousands of years, being used in earlier times for constructing homes, uh, for making clothes, irrigation systems, musical instruments, and even weapons. And because it's such a durable fiber, its more modern uses have expanded to include manufacturing plastic and even furniture. And it's also a food source for some people, as well as the giant panda, uh, the Chinese national animal. The pavilion's elaborate buildings are based upon specific locations in Beijing, the capital city of the People's Republic of China. And in fact, virtually every inch of the pavilion's opening day architectural design can be traced back to the celestial city. In order to enter the pavilion, guests enter through the gates, uh, the gate of the Golden Sun. This vivid structure was inspired by a gate at the Summer Palace. In this form, it is called Pai Fang. And Pai Fang are archways constructed of brick, stone, or wood, and are typically used to honor the ancestors of their resident family. The walls and roof of uh, Pai Fang are painted and decorated with carvings and colorful tiles. Even the red and gold colors of the gate are significant. Uh, Gold was the color used by the imperial family during the Qin dynasty. And in Chinese culture, gold represents uh, power and ability, ability, um, while red is for good luck and happiness. 
And blue is also predominantly displayed in both the gate and throughout the pavilion itself, and blue represents relaxation and healing uh, expiration. The colors are not the only indication that this gate is one of royalty. Standing guard at the top are figures of the dragon in the phoenix, both powerful images in Chinese art and architecture. Chinese emperors ruling as early as the Qin dynasty uh, thought of themselves as descendants from the dragons. Taking the title of True Dragon, they used five clawed dragons as their symbol. Four clawed dragons represented princes and kings. The people of ancient China believed that their land is the center of the known world, and it was believed that as a dragon moved further away from China, he would lose his claws, which is why other Asian cultures such as Japan and Korea use dragons, but they never actually have more than four claws. So, back to the phoenix. Uh, it's also an appropriate symbol for the original Paifang, upon which the original Gate of the Rising Sun was based. Despite, uh, despite being constructed many times, it was also destroyed many times throughout its existence, due you know, partially to the Second Opium War of 1860 and the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. Each time, it was rebuilt bigger and better, and it was made a public park in 1924 and a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1998. The icon of the, or sorry, the entwined dragon and phoenix is also a reoccurring artistic theme in what is perhaps the most recognizable structure in the China Pavilion, the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvest. This distinctive conical blue building is virtually an exact replica of the same structure at the Temple of Heaven complex in Beijing, uh, and the original was also named a World Heritage Site in 1998. The actual Temple of Heaven in Beijing is an impressive site with an area of over 3 million square yards. This is considerably larger than the Emperor's Forbidden City, which covers about 885,000 square yards. And according to Chinese tradition, the Emperor's home could not be larger than a structure that was devoted to prayer and heaven. As the building name implies, the reigning emperor would enter the hall of prayer for good harvest every year on the winter solstice to offer prayers of thanksgiving for the previous year's bounty, and ask for further blessings for the coming years. It was originally built in rectangular shape in 1420 during the Ming Dynasty, but it was torn down and rebuilt in its current circular design in 1580, and it was actually opened to the public in 1912. The exterior of the hall centers around the idea of going up to heaven, which is symbolized in Chinese legends by the number 9. The hall in Beijing sits on three platforms, which each holds three tiers of stairs, adding to 9. Each of these tiers uses nine steps to the platform above. The building itself is composed of three layers of eaves covered in deep blue tiles, with blue representing the sky and the heavens. Gold phoenixes and dragons are on the exterior walls and at the top of the halls. Imagineers went to extraordinary efforts to replicate the architecture and artistry of the original building, even copying the interior and exterior tile by tile. Epcot's version is only half the size of the original, but it's still pretty huge. But inside the hall is a symphony of color, color that you can lose yourself in, with brilliant patterns of reds, purples, greens, blues, and golds. There's also a reoccurring motif of circles and squares, with the squares representing Earth and the circles uh, standing in for heaven, which basically comprises the known universe in Chinese culture. <laughs> so, Reflections of China is next, uh, a Circle Vision 360 film. Uh, the original version was called Wonders of China, Land of Beauty, Land of Time. A Chinese film crew worked with Disney on it, marking the very first time Western photographers were permitted to work inside China's borders in decades. The film is narrated by an actor portraying Chinese poet Li Bai, who lived from 701 through 762. It shows the wonders of China, such as the Great Wall, the Forbidden City, and the Gobi Desert. Next up is Tomb Warriors, Guardian Spirits of Ancient China, which features almost 200 miniature replicas of the Emperor's Terracotta Army. Now, artifacts from the uh, evacuation site where the original Terracotta Army was found can also be seen in the gallery. Um, the real versions of these were actually found in 1974, purely by accident, of course, and they're actually numbered well over 800 of them. And each one of the original ones and the replicas here are individualized with personal details, from facial features to their ranks being displayed. 
To shop, of course, there is the Street of Good Fortune. Though it may be too narrow when guests leave the Circle Vision film, this was done on purpose to simulate the crowded streets of major Chinese cities. Two large lion statues greet guests as they enter the House of Good Fortune, the most popular sh uh, shop there. They may seem identical at first, but one, the male, has a ball under his paw and represents the earth. The other, a female, has a cub beneath her to represent her maternal instinct. Though when it was opened in 1982 there were no places to eat, the pavilion today has many to choose from to taste China's traditional flavors. The Lotus Blossom Cafe is a quick serve restaurant offering standard Chinese fare. There is also the Nine Dragons with table service and plenty of savory treats. And the Joy of Tea is also there since China is the world leader in tea production. The China Pavilion has so much to offer and is really one that can't be missed. Definitely not. Yeah, uh, it's a gorgeous little pavilion. Yes, it is. So give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line and let us know what you think about the China Pavilion. Do you have any special memories from the first few years of its operation? Give us a call at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is the Maps of the Disney Parks, charting 60 years from California to Shanghai, uh, by Vanessa Hunt, Kevin Neary, and Susan Neary. Okay, so the Disney Maps book, as I'm going to call it, along with the recalled Walt Disney Studios book, are two of the most anticipated books of this year. And since the Disney Studios book has been recalled and isn't really available, this means the Disney Oh, wow, I'm going to have fun with this word today. The Disney <laughs> Maps book has to be the de facto holiday present for most people. And I think everybody's going to love it. So when you first get the book, you realize how hefty it is. It feels very solid and very well constructed. And most people, like myself, are surprised by the opening of the book, which is not traditional. Uh, it's actually more like a map that you fold open from the middle. So it's, it does make the book feel like it's enclosed in a slip cover or a box. There's no book jacket, but like I said, the, the front, the, the cover's basically cut in two and opens right and left, basically. Sort of like a map, it's neat. So uh, when I first went through the book, I was pretty amazed by the cover, but after reading a few pages, I realized that although it was a wonderfully artistic design, it's going to be more of a hindrance to the overall enjoyment of the book. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time harping on it because the book is amazing, but it did make it a little bit harder to read, to get the pages to lie flat, and I think it was kind of weird, but that's okay. Um, the book is uh, fairly large because it is covering from pre-Disneyland all the way to Shanghai. So we're basically going from, you know, the late 1940s up until 2016. Uh, the publishers, of course, have taken great advantage of the physical size of the book when they reproduce the maps. And, you know, that's what people want to see. Everyone loves maps. They're almost everyone's favorite collectible. And, you know, I can remember days living in Cincinnati, Ohio, of just staring at maps we had brought home from Kings Island and thinking about my next trip. So... It's wonderful to have a book like this. Uh, as I mentioned, many of the maps take up one entire page. Sometimes they take up two, uh, which is mostly the artwork that they've done. And they produce, uh, reproduce a lot of the fun maps, which, of course, were done by Sam McKim and most recently by Nina Ray Vaughn. And they'll also take a section of the map and blow it up on the following page. So the left-hand side would have the whole Disneyland for instance, fun map, and then the right side would have a blow-up of a, a small piece of the map, which was brilliant and a lot of fun. Uh, that's why they call it the Disneyland Fun Map. There were uh, quite a handful of maps I've never seen before, and there were a lot of preliminary drawings of the maps that I I'd never seen those either, and it was neat to see the process of how it went from line drawings to a fully colored published maps. I did love that, but you know, I would have rather had more maps and more close-up views, but it's really nice to appreciate the artistry and the amount of work that went into this. But still, I'd rather see more maps, so maybe we can get a second volume. Uh, there were 
several fairly large reproductions of maps that I had not seen anywhere else in this large of a scale. You know, they're maps of the original plans for the parks near the Disney Studios in Burbank. And I've always seen them fairly small. And here they have them on half a page. So you could really get a lot of the detail. And, you know, each book should have come with a magnifying glass so that you could really take good advantage of the maps and, and really see them. There's a lot of small details that you won't be able to make out, but you know, if, if anybody's got an iPhone with iOS 10, if you triple click on the home button, that turns it into a magnifying glass. It works wonderfully. So, <laughs> Pro tips by George Taylor. It does. Hey, if you got an iPhone, and buy the book together. So definitely go out, buy this book. As we always say, you probably want to get two copies because it is spectacular, and we know Disney books go out of print. Um, I would have done it a little bit differently if I had the chance, because I would have spent a whole book just looking at the maps of the Magic Kingdom, but then that's just me. But in this case, Disney has given us a wonderful overview of all the different types of maps that they've done. Not only maps of, uh, of the parks, but maps of different attractions and stylized maps of the insides of the attractions. It really is a gorgeous book, and I'm so glad that Disney has done it. So go get a copy right now. We'll wait till the episode's over, then go get it. Then go. Yeah. So this one was Maps of the Disney Parks, charting 60 years from California to Shanghai. Sometimes it's a one. Sometimes it's a two. When you gotta go, what you're gonna do? It's a bathroom break. A bathroom break. At Disney's animation building in Burbank, their bathrooms are pretty nicely themed. Well, not the insides of them, really, uh, but the plaques outside of them are. So, the signs that tell whether they are for men or women all have silhouettes of animated characters from Disney films on them. So, for example, you know, one of the men's rooms has, uh, has Wreck-It Ralph on it, one has Flynn Rider, and then another one has Bolt. And then the women's room, you know, one has Princess Tiana, uh, the sisters from Frozen, and so, so on. And it seems that they change the signs often to reflect the latest releases because there's actually Mo Moana characters adorned a few of them as well. So if you're for whatever reason, if you're ever in the Disney Animation Building and you have to use the restroom, make sure you check one of these out. There's 16 of them total. They're all over the building, and it's pretty cool. Is there like a punch card so you know when you've done all 16 of them? Uh, I don't know. Maybe if you do all 16, you get one free? Oh, that's good. Who knows? Okay. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look. What's that? It's a five-legged goat. So there is a subtle three caballeros reference in the World of Disney store in uh, Walt Disney World's Disney Springs. So in the center room, there are murals all around telling little stories of Mickey and his friends traveling around the world. And one of the stops that they go to is Antarctica, where Donald and his nephews are playing ice hockey. And of course, all well and good, but the folks who designed this mural went a little step further and added a cute little penguin and a hat and a scarf and mittens just coming out of an igloo to check out what's going on. But this is no ordinary penguin. No, it's none other than Pablo the Penguin from The Three Caballeros, who dreams of a sunnier life before heading out on an adventure in the film itself. So it was a cool little nod to my favorite Disney film. Yeah, no kidding. And if you want to visit a sunnier place in life, then you definitely need to contact Fairy Godmother Travel. I don't know where this is going. Who is sponsoring this week's Year of a Million or So Linda Time Cadets Weekly Prize. Okay, well done. Hey. Well done. Who pulled that one out of yes, my Yes, you did. I wasn't mittens. sure if you were going to, but... Exactly. So, as you guys know, we have been doing the year... And more of a million or so little time. A cadets. bunch of long time. We've done a, a bunch of bunch of cadets. bunch of longs, and each week we're giving away a prize. And all you have to do to enter is email weekly at gmail.com with your name and address, so we can email email you the prize. Yes, so we can physically <laughs> mail you the prize, unless it's a digital prize. Who exactly. knows? Exactly. I mean, we are trying to we are trying to keep the post office in business with this mm -hmm. prize thing. Um, so remember, email us. And as we mentioned, this week's prize is coming from Teresa Corey and the wonderful travel agents at Fairy Godmother Travel, and the prize is going to Kate B who lives in Danvers, Massachusetts. Yay, Yay. Kate. And, you know, and if she stays current and hears it, it might actually pretty be pretty cold in Massachusetts. It actually might be right so now. So she sure might is. want to visit a sunnier place. Hey. Hey, all right. Nice work. <laughs> so uh, 
Well, thank you guys so much for watching, listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yeah, however you get the show, whether on iTunes or YouTube, leave us a comment, leave us a rating. We'd love to hear what you think. Exactly. Email us again at communicoreweekly at gmail.com to enter the contest or just say what's up. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicoreweekly. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. And make sure you visit CommunicoreWeekly.com and look at the Communa store where you can pick up some fantastic t-shirts and other swag. And you can still get your official cadet membership card and sticker by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And make sure you visit patreon.com slash Weekly to see how you two can support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Egg bun. <laughs>